So the federal government has to give down money that's going to trickle down to state and to cities so that the programs of prevention and support, as you mentioned, and jobs and the things that help parents, if those are not put in place and the only thing we have is police, this problem is only going to get worse. Thank you for being here tonight. The, the, our topic, unfortunately, is violence in Chicago. We've been hearing a lot lately about Chicago's deadly streets. A uh, recent string of violent murders and beatings that have occurred in our city, in fact, uh, prompted CNN to run a story with that title, Chicago's Deadly Streets. We want to get at some of the roots of those problems and those challenges tonight. And, this, and, and we want to acknowledge, of course, that this is uh, not a problem for just any one neighborhood or one, any one community. It's a citywide, nationwide problem. And we want to hear from you, as Brianne says, we're, there's going to be plenty of time for conversation and discussion. Um, first, first of all, we want to spend a little bit of time with our stellar panel. I'm going to start by introducing each one of them and then asking them to start off with opening statements. I'm going to start with my immediate left. Floyd Brown is a senior at John Marshall High School. He's a member of the swim team, and he also volunteers at the Association House through Listo, which is an after-school program for elementary school students. Mr. Brown lives in Humboldt Park, and he's a member of the 14-member Youth Safety Council, which he's served on since August of 2008. The council focuses on ways to decrease violence in Chicago schools and communities by promoting youth safety. Floyd Brown. Next is Mr. Philip Hampton, who became director of the Chicago Alternative Policing Strategy in July of this year. He's returning to CAPS after a five-year absence. In 1996, he worked as a supervisor for CAPS before moving to Chicago Public Schools as community relations director. He's also served as the director of the city of Chicago's 311 Center. Mr. Hampton is a former high school educator and a lifelong Chicagoan. Philip Hampton. T.O. Hardiman is Director of Mediation Services at Ceasefire. He grew up in Chicago's Henry Horner Homes in Avalon Park. Due to adverse circumstances, he had to drop out of high school and take on jobs to support his family. Yet, he later received several degrees, including a master's degree from Northeastern Illinois University. Mr. Hardiman has worked for the Chicago Alliance for Neighborhood Safety, where he organized over 50 block clubs and facilitated problem-solving sessions for crime-ridden communities. He's also served as a community organizer for Bethel New Life on the city's west side. In 1999, he joined the Chicago Project for Violence Prevention, which works to reduce the city's homicide race. Tweel Harbor. <laughs> Father Michael Flager has been an activist and pastor in Chicago for many years. Since 1968, he has lived and ministered in African-American communities on the south and west sides of Chicago. He was ordained a priest of the, by the Archdiocese of Chicago in 1975. In 1981, at the age of 31, he became the youngest full pastor in the diocese when he was appointed pastor of St. Sabina Church, where he remains today. He's worked on campaigns against the sale of drug paraphernalia, billboards that target children with alcohol and tobacco advertising, and negative music that glorifies violence and degrades women, uh, as well as the easy access to guns. Michael Flager. And we're going to start off with uh, asking you to spend a few minutes answering the question, what's at the root of this violence? And please name one solution, a new solution, that you think can have an impact. Feel also free to, to, to discuss any, any of the efforts you're doing in, in the city. All Starting. right. Um, I would say the, I think the root cause of violence would be poverty. I would say access to guns. And I would say broken homes and, and lack of family structure. And my new idea that I think will have an impact would be to implement more, to imp implement more violence prevention and peace programs in middle schools and elementary schools. And also, um, as you all know, I'm a member of the Youth Safety Council. Mm -hmm. And past the summer, we conducted a research on uh, safety issues. And we also work with Support and Family Services of Chicago. And so with that, we, we did the report. We went to um, a lot of organizations that also focused on some of the issues that we were, which I can remember off the top was Build. I remember mm -hmm. Umoja, Elevate. It was, um, and a few more. 
and basically we took all the information and we put it into report and we presented it to Commissioner Karen. And so she was she really liked it and so from there we've just been keep going on with what we've been doing. So. Great, it's great the work you do. So what, t tell us a little bit about the research. What did you find that you reported? In the research, the research was of 758 st uh, students from all over Chicago. And so basically we were asking them what is the, some of the same questions. What was the root cause? What do they think the root cause of the violence was? Uh, who was to blame for violence? And um, what would they, and other specific questions as well. And the responses to those were just phenomenal because youth, they answered the best way they could and they blame, and one of the questions I like was who they blame and youth, uh, 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 the whole poll, mostly the whole poll of youth said that they blame themselves first. Wow. So I was like glad that they know that they have a part in it and then there was other categories, but I was really happy about that. And also the report goes on to peace strategies that we did. We researched peace strategies and where should we target middle school? That was one of the questions. Where should we start targeting violence to decrease it? And the answer to that was middle schools. And why, why, why middle schools? Because they, they think that when we started targeting middle schools, um, in middle school, um, kids started to find where they belong or their setting and basically we start targeting them first so we can get to them before the the mind setting gets in and show them peace strategies on how to calm themselves and movements and breathing techniques to calm themselves and to think about their actions before they do it so by the time they get to high school they won't be as much affected they will know how to calm themselves think about their actions and be in a better mindset and behavior setting so well that's just great i mean i think one of the challenges we have is including the young people in these mm. discussions and in these solutions so yes. so often we overlook them and and look to the adults but even even the young people realize that they have to be part of the solution yes thank you we'll come back to more conversation about the peace strategies i hope a little bit later all right mr hampton yes ma'am it's your turn. It's my turn. Well, What's your solution? Well, I was uh, so captured by Floyd. Uh, there, I, I think it's very complex um, and it's difficult to offer one single uh, problem um, before, I, of course, I talk about one specific solution I think will help. Uh, there's a number of factors that contribute to it, but I'm sure we can all agree that the social uh, economic factors, poverty that was identified by Floyd, uh, gangs, drugs, uh, and something that I, I don't hear a lot about. I hear a lot of blame for institutions, groups, parents, lack of parents, et cetera, but I really don't hear much in terms of uh, interpersonal skills. Um, I think a lot of it has, it's a lot of anxiety, it's a lot of stress now. Um, because of the times. And I think that uh, if you look at crime and if you look at, uh, really examine the incidents that take place, most incidents are between people that know one another or have had some kind of contact with one another. So we really need to get back to building relationships and dealing with these interpersonal issues that sometimes lead to skill building where we can do something other than reacting in a way that's violent. Um, to offer one solution, uh, and again, there's no one simple solution, but Floyd, uh, he really hit directly on the one solution that I would like to really further and talk about tonight, uh, and that's really engaging young people. Um, I look at the incidents that have taken place uh, especially the ones that have been really highlighted over the media uh, of late. And you see a lot of adults reacting and responding, some for, I don't know what the motives for everyone who's reacting and responding, but I do know that young people do have a voice, um, they do have an opinion, and they do have, they play a role in uh, a solution. One of the things that we recently, uh, in a group that I'm working with, uh, we recently started engaging high school and middle school age students in this whole issue of the code of silence. 
uh, and I have to be t and I have to be honest with you. A lot of folks that our uh, decision makers told me, well, Philip, I don't know, I, you may be wasting your time, but I don't think we're wasting our time. I think we need to really go to the age group and hear from them on some of the solutions. Uh, and I think we could learn something. And talk a little bit about what is a code of silence. Well, let me give you a brief description of what, what, what it is. Uh, it's a national issue. The Department of Justice put out a document that talks about that law enforcement across the country, um, when a crime take place, there are countless individuals who refuse to cooperate with the police. Now, I have to tell you, you know, I, I grew up in Inglewood community, so I understand, and I want that to be clear, I understand where some of that comes from. But I also recognize this, if you look at the number of shootings, just specific to shootings, aggravated batteries that take place. A lot of those shootings continue to reproduce themselves because individuals, they will not talk to an authority figure to say who was involved. And if it's not the police, they could talk to clergy, they could talk to leaders in organizations, but a lot of times that is not happening. So what happens? This shooting leads to what? Another shooting. That shooting leads to another shooting and another. Um, and that, can, that should concern us. Um, we should try to repair, find a way where individuals feel that they are comfortable sharing this kind of information with someone so it can get to, it, to the right authorities. A lot to talk about here, and uh, uh, we'll continue that. The, the code of silence, I think, is, 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 has plays a major role, and there's reasons for that. As you, as, I'm, as you said, you grew up in Inglewood, so you know what some of them are. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Sure. Tio Hardiman. Yeah. Um, when it comes down to uh, maybe the assessing the problem of violence in the city of Chicago, I'm born and raised in the Henry Hornet Projects myself, and I understand the code of silence. I understand the code of the streets. In my analogy, since I've been doing this work for about 15 years, trying to prevent violence on the front end, uh, there are two realities across America. One is the working class reality, where everybody goes to work to pay their bills, take care of their families, and you had a subculture of violence reality, where everything goes. And the only way to break the code of silence is to talk your friend out of shooting somebody in the first place. That's, how, that's one way to break the code of silence, because then you don't have to get, the police don't have to get involved, you can just talk your friends down. On behalf of ceasefire, ceasefire is a public health model that we implement in communities to ch try to help change behaviors. And that's just one of the roles that I play, you know, at ceasefire. However, you know, we have violence interrupters, outreach workers who work with young men and women on a regular basis. Uh, we've mediated over 260 conflicts this year alone that uh, we stop somebody from shooting somebody on the front end because young guys trust the people that work for us, and we call them violence interrupters, and they're credible messengers. Guys that come from the streets who understand the street culture, and these guys have backbone and fortitude, and they can go in there and make sense out of the madness and stop some guys in their tracks when they put them gorilla masks on their face. A lot of times, people don't want to talk to the toughest of toughest guys on the streets of Chicago, but you have to have specialty teams out there that understand those guys, and then everybody else can do what they do. Uh, the police job is to catch guys when they cross the line, and ceasefire, our job is to stop a guy from crossing the line. That's what it's all about, as far as. Now, I get letters written to me from young guys all across the state of Illinois all the time, and a lot of letters that I receive, guys say that uh, the youth feel abandoned by the adults. Whether that's true or false, I couldn't answer that for you. A lot of you feel disenfranchised. They feel that, that a lot of adults don't understand them. Speaking on behalf of the African American community, I do know one thing. There's a major disconnect with the older people and the young people. I know that much. And there's some kind of way we're going to have to bridge the gap there and uh, bring people back together. Because uh, when the young people don't listen to their parents, you can't expect them to listen to nobody else because it starts at home. There's a generational divide that we have to address. And another thing that led to a lot of problems, in my opinion, based on my research and my personal experiences, that when heroin addiction hit the African-American community in the 70s, uh, a lot of the men were uh, taken away from the homes because of addiction. 
And there was a, a high, heavy proliferation of guns that, that were introduced to the community and drugs. But in the 80s and the 90s, when crack cocaine hit the community, it took the mothers out the house. Mm -hmm. So now you had a lot of the young men and women being raised by their grandparents, which is okay, but at the same time, a lot of kids raised themselves. So here it is now, I'm a grown man, and uh, I've been raising myself since I was 10, and I've, been, I've received a lot of misinformation throughout all these years, and here you come trying to tell me what to do. I'm not saying whether it's right or wrong, but these young guys need a lot of help. There was recently a, uh, some research done. There are 27 million Americans on antidepressant depressant med medications right now. So there's a lot of problems in the mm -hmm. community. You, uh, you've just named so, quite, quite a few. Right, right. Picking up on the relationship yeah, issue with parents mm -hmm. and parenting, right. uh, when Eric Holder and Arnie Duncan were here uh, right after the Darian Albert uh, dis, uh, incident mm -hmm. uh, and had a press conference at City Hall with the mayor, they said they met with some of the young people who were involved and in, in live out in those communities and that they, they were hearing over and over again a lack of mentoring. Would you, would you react to that, react to that, T.O. Hardiman? And yes, you. And, and is that, in, is that as, I mean, they named that as the number one issue that they, they thought needed to be addressed, at, that, well, at least at that press conference. Well, the mentoring has to really come from the peers. You can get guys to come out and talk to the guys and understand them. And the reason I say from their peers, because if you're an older guy and you're a mentor of a young guy, you're not out there with him 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And a lot of things that take place on ground zero, you need guys that are designated, like you have a designated driver that'll hmm. drive when everybody's drunk. You need a designated peacemaker on the block. You really do, because a lot of times mm -hmm. funds go to a lot of agencies. And I'm, I, I work with Ceasefire, and I believe Ceasefire is one of the solutions as far as addressing the issue, but I don't want to discredit or, or not take a look at other programs as well, because mm -hmm. we're all in this together. So uh, the, the point I'm really trying to make here is that we have to find a way to convert the young, the, the, uh, young guys, excuse me, the young guys right there on the blocks mm -hmm. and get them to turn them into peacemakers so they can keep their peers cool. Because that's the only way you're really going to stop How the violence. Do you, now, you're talking about young men or maybe a little, little bit older men than the mm. young men that you're trying to reach, mm. mentoring each other, working with each other on the street. What happened to, what happened to the family? What happened to, mm. when, I think when, what Arnie Duncan was talking about was mm. mentoring from parents, from uncles, from grandfathers mm -hmm. or grandmothers. Mm. Is that not, an, is, is that not a, an option in some well, of these communities? Well, it's definitely an option, but when you've got uncles and grandmothers in the house and they're positive, in most cases, a lot of the young men do come from positive families. They just positive get sucked meaning. up into the street life. You know, they get caught up in that belief system. You know, my uncles, when I was growing up, my uncles were drug uh, shooters. They intravenous heroin addicts, and they used to give me a lot of misinformation, like <laughs> young men shouldn't cry, you know, uh, stand up, man up, you know. And what does that mean? Yeah, I'm already a man. Why I got to man up? I know I'm a man, right? But the thing is, you get misinformation, and then uh, for about 15 years in my life, I believed in the code of the streets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believed that it was okay to overlook crime. I believed it was okay to step to people at once upon a time. You couldn't tell me anything. So now I understand the mindset of the young guys, but at the same time, something has to change. And we have to change behaviors by changing communities as well. Mm -hmm. These young guys need to feel safe in the community. People don't know how to get along. 70% of these young brothers are on the defense yeah. because they don't want to be victimized. There's a lot of paranoia in the community. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting this from the young guys that talk to me. I'm not just talking for myself. Mm -hmm. I work with young guys all the time. As a matter of fact, I'm in the process Saturday, November 14th, of bringing 30 young guys from the Ville area together with 30 young guys from Argyle Gardens so we can uh, address the issues there and uh, get them to kind of like establish a peace treaty to coexist. They're not going to And sign these are the two official. neighborhoods, to just remind people, these are right. two neighborhoods yeah, that, yeah. Were, that were... This, in conflict. The, this, in conflict for the Darian Albert uh, situation. Yeah, they were in conflict, yeah. but at the same time, and I'm not going to do all the talking, I just want to make this last point. Right. I found out by talking to all the young guys in, in that particular area, it's not just the Ville, it's not just Argyle Gardens, mm -hmm. it's the whole hundreds. That's right. <laughs> so I have to go from 95th Street to 130th Street and from Halstead to State Street and meet with young guys on all the corners out there and get them involved in the peace process as well and let them make their own rules. I'm just going to serve as a mediator right. or maybe as a facilitator. Mm -hmm. A lot of work out there to do. Yes. Father Flager, I know you're itching to get in here. No, I've, <laughs> I've got great people up here. I'm just yeah. here listening. Um, I think, it, you know, just a number of things. I'm trying to talk the problem and, and some solutions at the same time. But I think what, uh, what Phil said about the comprehensive, that is no, there's no Band-Aid solution. There's no easy fix. There's no one, one thing we can do with this. And everybody's accountable. And the worst thing we can do is become a blame game and think if this one does or that one fixes it, they can do it. It's everybody. I just want to list about eight things. One is we, we have to, like, like Floyd was talking about the poverty issue, we have to deal with jobs. 
we have to deal with employment. You know, people have to be able to take care of themselves, or as like Teal said, then there's going to be a street mentality. I'm going to survive somehow. So we have to provide the jobs and the employment, not just for adults, but also for youth. We have to provide jobs for our, for our young people. Um, we have to find positive alternatives for young people to turn to. We can't just keep saying what not to do. Well, we've got to give them things to plug into. Where young people are involved in positive activities after school and on weekends, um, they're, they're less likely to be involved in trouble. So we need positive alternatives. We need to demand and provide excellent education in every single school in the city. Not just certain schools, not just magnet schools, not just certain neighborhoods. Education provides options. The more education one has, the more options one has choose about their future. So we need to provide good schools, and we also need to have teaching our schools conflict resolution uh, and consequences. A lot of kids end up in, in I'm meeting them at jail or at Audio Home, they say, I never knew this could happen. I didn't know I could get in for this. We talk consequences about tobacco in this country, and everybody started to back off from smoking. This is what can happen to you. We've got to teach consequences about crime, consequences about what happens if you have a gun. We've done a great job in America teaching violence. We've taught it from bombing in Iraq and Afghanistan. We've taught it from glorifying uh, music um, and, and video games from, from uh, Grand Theft Auto and on. We see it in healthcare meetings when people are pushing and shoving and calling each other names. We teach violence. We've now got to teach peace and conflict resolution, teach respect and values of each other. We've got to get some Congress that has courage and has the guts to do something about this gun issue. You can get a gun for $20 in any corner in my community. Mm -hmm. Anybody can get a gun at any time. We have to stop the easy access to guns. And, and well, we, we have to start. We do have gun control in the city right now. <laughs> we have gun control in the city, so I, can so, go to, so I can go to Harvey and get a gun. Mm -hmm. I can go okay. to, and I can get them in the city. I don't have to go anywhere because mm -hmm. they're so accessible every place else mm -hmm. that you can't control it for the city. We need national mm -hmm. federal regis legislation. I say title guns like cars. You can start it right from the manufacturer. You can control guns that are coming out. Uh, a couple last things is family structure. Um, the family structure is broken. The village is broken. And we have to learn how to, to help rebuild the family structure and provide the, the, the added family structure in the meantime. The mentors we're talking about, the support mm -hmm. needed to build an extended family. We have to do like Teal does with the intervention and prevention. Everyone thinks we can police our way out of this, call in mm -hmm. the National Guard. They come in when, like Teal when you cross the line. We've got to get them before they cross the line, get the intervention, the prevention, to keep them from calling, having to call 911 on them. Not only rebuild the family structure, but the, the community. The safety nets are gone. You talked, Laura, about how there was the police person, there was the store owner, there was the neighbor, there was aunt, all those people that, you know, that were the community that raised a child. Those communities don't exist anymore. We don't know the neighbors next door, upstairs, downstairs, so that we have to recommit that community and cause communities not only to re be rebuilt, but reconnected. We live in our society now, if we're worried about Ms. Jones, call 311 and have a, a well-being check on her. No, walk across the street and check on her. We want a blue light put up, those are the crime. No, you, as, as Teal just said, you be the safety person maker and the peacemaker on that block. Mm -hmm. So we related to let somebody else run our blocks, run our homes, run our communities, and we have to rebuild, rebuild communities, rebuild homes, and rebuild families. We have to, I think, set up uh, the primary persons in our communities, as, as Steve was saying, who are going to be the voices to speak out on every block, and that's block to block mm -hmm. across the community. Faith communities got to deal with the issue. They, they're dealing with the violence like they, deal, like they deal with AIDS. Don't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And faith communities have to begin to address this issue and confront and challenge congregations to be aggressively involved in the violence solving. We need young people like Floyd to be the spokesperson of this. You know, I, I love what Tia said about, about stepping up and telling people to man down. And when I was growing up and somebody, did, you know, we would say to one man, cut that out, put that away, get right. down, shut up. You know, come on. We did that to each other. We need now to have young people to step up and begin to be the ones who talk to and talk with each other to help stop that. Lastly, that I want to say right now is that connecting the dots. We have all this, you know, we have government doing one thing, school doing one thing, community doing one thing, activists doing one thing, all these different organizations. It's going to need everybody to come. If we can't come together in leadership, how do we expect people to come together in the community? So we have to begin to build the partnerships and understand we all need each other. We all need to work together. We all need to be on the same page, on equal ground, business, church, schools, government, law enforcement, residents, mm -hmm. parents, teachers. We, if we don't get together and decide together to stop this thing, we're going to watch the community be destroyed. So. Well, 
We've, with all due respect, Father Flaker, you've been on the front lines for 40 years, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, like <laughs> it feels like 100. <laughs> What's different? Th what's going to be different this time? This, you know, this is just the most recent horrific case of a young person being killed. We can go back. There's a long list of long roster of, of, of bodies before this one. Um, is this a different? Is there, is there something different about this these times? And I want to hear from all of you about this. Mm -hmm. Let me actually start with you, Floyd. What's the, now? You're the youngest one on the, on, <laughs> the, on, on the stage, but you're the one living closest to it. Is there something different that you're feeling out there now? because of the Darian Albert case, it might make a difference? Um, or what do we need to do that we haven't been doing? Okay, um, starting with the, since the Darian Albert incident, I've personally spoken with youth that um, knew about Fanger and uh, with my peers and also at um, MICFA, and we actually had discussions the about MICFA this. MICFA Challenge, which yeah, you Yeah, MICFA Challenge, at. which I work at. And, um, it's getting higher. I believe that it's getting higher because now in school, if you you want you want to see a fight, you can just turn around the hallway, because it's just so out of control. And usually, me coming from I used to go to, when I was in grammar school, and looking now, like in grammar school, when there was a fight, it was just a boy on boy one on one fight, and usually the teacher break it up within a minute. But now in high school with youth and teenagers, it's like five on five to one or it takes it's just out of control and usually they use weapons and, and this is are this is this happening in the school yes it inside is inside the school yes it is so it's really out of control and after school as well right on the school grounds there's usually a fight maybe twice a day so it's getting very high so and this is happening mainly in the high schools yes i do Mainly but, in high schools and after school. Right, but that's what that gets back to your earlier point about this. We need to catch these young people before they get to that, yes, to we that do. place. Yes, we do. Other gentlemen <clears throat> want to respond on this issue. Well, is this what's different now? Or well, is it anything different now? If we think back several years ago, and I'm sure you will recall uh, Robert Sandifer, young yummy man, Sandifer. yummy Sandifer, and it was the same kind of situation. You had a outcry in the community, uh, a lot of folks. Um, responded appropriately and did some things, but what happened? It's human nature that after a while, you didn't hear much about it anymore. So I'm hoping that with this situation with uh, Darren Albert, that we can sustain some energy around this issue. You know, Father Flager says something that I really, really um, agree with, um, the fact that Everyone has to, in any kind of position, uh, should be a part of sustaining this conversation and sustaining a solution and get away from fragmenting ourselves and competing uh, against ourselves. And you're, this, talking, and you're talking about there are groups out there. We talked a little bit about, bit about sure. this backstage. There's, there are groups out there that are all looking for money, all looking for support and help, and they're, and they're not necessarily working together. Sure, sure. Well, the, yes. Yes, that is correct, and it's been demonstrated, um, and it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But we have to move beyond that, and for people who are really working on solutions, working in community, you have to do this. You know, what concerns me is there are a lot of people that are doing good things that have not had the media spotlight on them. For, for example, we work with over 3,500 block clubs across the city. Uh, and these people uh, work with, on their blocks, they do all kinds of things to support empowering and building the community, but because of it, there's no sensationalism, that's boring. Relative to that, you don't see the cameras. And so their work is not reinforced. But let's go right back to what happened at Finger High School last Friday when there was a lunchroom incident that made the news. I have a problem with that. What's the problem? With the that? problem is, is that somewhere along this line, this stuff has become so sensationalistic that uh, it, we love violence. We've been taught it. And it's become so Americanized that if a, a horrific incident takes place, 
here comes the cameras, everybody's there. Right? Well, but yeah. When you, when you say we, you're not just talking about the media, though. You're talking about us, right? Oh, yeah. I'm talking about everyone. The media shows up and reports oh, absolutely. this because we as viewers, as readers, want to see this. We want to see it. So everybody, everybody has a responsibility in that, right? So when I say we, I mean globally. But it feeds itself. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So when I talk to folks who work within the block clubs and many people who are doing good work, they feel overwhelmed because they are constantly bombarded with just the unfortunate incidents. And it seems as if they're not people, although there needs to be a lot of good work, a lot of improvement, it seems as if there are not many people doing some wonderful things than they are. Yes, just, just give me a quick, just one quick example of what's going on in those black well, clubs that you don't hear about that's making a difference. Well, I'll give you a, a, a real good example that I became aware of, of a group I talked to yesterday. There's a Black United Fund in the South Shore area. They work to develop their own safe, safe passage program. So uh, they have about 40 individuals that are providing safe passage for Boucher Elementary, Bradwell Elementary, and they're starting on South Shore High School. And they've been doing this for a number of years. Mm -hmm. A number of years. Last year, for our account, we counted uh, about 1,400 parent patrol volunteers across the, uh, across the city, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But one would think that people are not engaged and involved. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of people who are out doing the work without the cameras or the pats on the back. They're just doing the good work as they should. Thanks for telling us some good sure. news. T.O. Hardiman. Yeah, the problem is nothing new. I must admit, uh, here in Chicago, the homicide rate is steady pretty much going down. Homicide rate is, uh, uh, you know, like I said, for, for a matter of fa as a matter of fact, in uh, 2008, there were 510 homicides. This year, they're close to around 400 already. Now, across America, there are like around 16,000 homicides a year. Uh, it's nothing new. I, I want everybody to make sure they get that point because a lot of times we hear that the Chicago Public School students have been killed. You don't hear the stories of all the other people that might be older than the Chicago Public Schools. Chicago public school student being killed. It's happening all across Chicago. Uh, right now, Chicago ranks number 27 uh, on the list of uh, major cities when it comes down to the homicide rate. Uh, New Orleans is number one. There's about 18 people killed per 100,000 people in Chicago. But the leading cause of death for African-American youth between the age of 15 and 24 is homicide. And this, it's been that way for the last 20 years. So, so it's nothing new. So why are we going to get, be able to, to do something new? Well, the thing is, you have to take radical measures. You have to be willing to step up and, and try different techniques. We have to put a remix on violence prevention. We have to meet the people where they are. A lot of times you have professional social workers. You have the mentors that people always talk about. And you have people that wear their suits like I have on today. If we're good people doing the work, we can actually get through to some of the young people. But we may have to hire a, a whole lot of young people educate them, train them, and go get the roughest of roughest young guys. I'm not talking about working with the marginal young men and women. I'm talking about go out there and get the killers, put them in a basement, talk to them, confront them one by one, and try to win them over and get them on your side, because then they can actually have influence over their peers and stop the other killers from killing. You see, and like Brother Phil was talking about, it's ceasefire. When we stop a guy from shooting somebody on the front end, we don't get a lot of publicity for it. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a quick story. There was a young guy, 21 years old, from the West Humble Park community. His, he had just had a newborn. His uh, girlfriend had just gave birth to his son. His son's about six months. He went over to visit his son, and another guy answered the door, a guy that was 24 years old. This guy, his heart was broken. He ran home to get a gun to come back and shoot the guy because the guy told him to get from in front of his girl's house. This guy loved his girl. He just had a son by him. His father saw him pick his gun up because his father was a county sheriff. His father called the ceasefire violence and interrupters. We rushed to the house. So when the young man got back in front of the house with the gun, the interrupter was right there waiting for him. So we talked to the guy. We went upstairs and talked to the other guy. And we asked the girl to make a decision who she really wanted to be with. She couldn't make a decision. She said, I just deal with both of them. So we had to go down there and break the news to this kid with a gun in his hand mm -hmm wanting to shoot somebody because his emotions were very high. Mm. This is just one story. Mm. But we talked him down. We got him to give, give his, uh, get a gun back to his father. And uh, we worked the situation out. But this brother was really distraught. He was hurt. Emotions play a strong role in a lot of violence as well. Mm. We're not going to get no publicity for that. 
Father Flager has called me on numerous occasions where we had to get young guys out of gangs. Yeah. There was a Latino kid, his grandmother came to our office crying crocodile tears along with his mother. The, the uh, guys in the gang, they had been beating him up every day of the week as a frail kid. And um, they wanted to violate him. They, gave, they put an SOS out of him, shoot on sight. And we talked him down. We talked him down. But these are some measures you have to take. Mm -hmm. And now the kid is doing OK. He's working a job. But we, had to, we didn't pay him. They wanted to violate this kid for three minutes. And they wanted $100 per minute. We don't normally do this, but we gave the guys $300. We did that mm -hmm. because we want to save his life because they were going to kill this kid. Now he lives in the suburbs. He's going, you know, he's working. That's one thing I can mm -hmm. tell you. But these are yeah. stories that you don't hear about. And you have to take radical measures when you're dealing with radical mm -hmm. conditions. You got to have the right people that can talk to these guys and meet them where they are. And then we turn them over once we get them to where they understand life on life terms. Then we turn them over to the Father Flagers mm -hmm. and the community organizations. But we, you know what, there's a lot of drug addiction people don't talk about. These guys get to drinking that alcohol at 12 midnight. They get to dropping them pills. You can't tell them anything. Some of our guys have walked up on guys at Crane High School. Mm -hmm. We had a mother that pulled up and she opened her trunk up and she was giving table legs out to her kids, telling them to beat people up. We had to yeah. talk to the mother, we had to keep, keep her cool, and we had to take the table legs out of the teenager's hands. So this is the kind of work you have to do in right. order to make sense out of mm -hmm. the madness, and then you kind of follow up the young man on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing new, I just want to yeah. make that clear. It's just more publicized now, mm -hmm. because homicides were at, in the 70s, yeah. 900, right. then it went down you know, from 900 to 800, then at one time, you know, now we're a little bit under 500 now. Right. It's, so, you know. it's getting younger, though. I think, you right. know, what Floyd says, it's getting yeah. younger and it's, and it's getting into the schools and it's getting into right. places that you people used to see as safe spaces. Mm -hmm. And that's very frightening. Um, nothing new, Father Flager, you right. know better as well as anyone, nothing new. You, you had a young person that was very close to you mm -hmm. uh, that you lost to violence, was it over 10 yeah, years ago? Foster son, right, 98. Foster son. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's anything new. We can go back to Ben Smith, we can right. go to Santa Fe, we can go to. Uh, we are hold a couple of years mm -hmm. ago, and now Darian, and we see all the, these killings. It's nothing, it's nothing new, but I think two things that we have learned is, number one, we always thought we could police our way out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody knows we can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, globally, you know, what had President Obama been saying? We can't just bound. We've got to try to talk to our enemies. We've got to talk to one another. Mm -hmm. And we, where it didn't work globally, it doesn't work on the street. So policing our way out of it is not going to work. So I think we're learning that now. We've got to do something on the front end. We've got to talk to them. We've got to intervene with them. We've got to have conversations with them. But I think the second thing that's changing is it's now affecting more and more people. You know, when it was just a black and brown crime, um, people in, the, in another whole part of the segment of society ignored it. But when there's Columbine, when there's Virginia Tech, when there's NIU, when there's a minister down south, when there's, look at today with Fort Hood. Mm -hmm. You know, when we see this violence now affecting everybody around the country mm -hmm. um, and in every community, you can't go three blocks without remembering where somebody was shot or where somebody, whether it used to be a teddy bear or a, or a balloon up, there are the new landmarks in our neighborhoods. And so it's affected a much, a much broader spectrum, not just in the communities, but also in the cities and in the states. And I think that is now causing a greater consciousness and a waking up and people saying, whoa, we got to get something, because people are realizing nobody is going to be safe from violence. Mm -hmm. okay. I, I, I know that people are eager to join this conversation, so I'm going to just ask one more quick question. But in the meantime, if you all have questions or comments, there's a microphone right over here. Please step up to the mic. Um, I especially encourage the young people in the audience um, who have ideas or thoughts to share them. Please, please come up. And in, in the meantime, I just want to ask, I want to come back to Floyd and ask you to put you on the spot on this one, Floyd. I'm the only woman up on this panel. <laughs> and I know that this is not just a guy problem. And there, was, there were two young women, was it a year or so ago, in Inglewood who were killed. Sarkeesia Reed was one of them. I forget the other young lady's name. But young women are, are being caught up in this violence. What, 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 can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing or your colleagues are doing to, to address the needs for young women, and are there, are there, are there different challenges there for the, for the young women and girls? Um, with the work that we're doing, I got to say that we haven't really focused on women in, in violence directly. So the work that we're doing, it's basically teens in general, mm -hmm. men, I mean, well, men, women, you know, teenagers, and so basically what we're, what we're working on and doing is we want 
we want to prevent, we're trying to decrease it, and we want to let teens know, you know, that there's other ways that you could go around. There's talking, there's programs there's, that we're trying to implement to get into elementary schools, and um, there are a few are already in high schools that can help. And we want you to know that they, as, like they said, they have a voice. Mm -hmm. Youth have a voice. Are there young women on your on your youth council? Are there women members, young young girls? Yes, yeah. they are. They they are. So. And what do they have to say about this problem? What are they telling you? They are passionate about this <laughs> okay. problem, and um, as we're saying, the Para Patrol actually. A female peer of mine, Sh Shanetta Brown, she mentioned, she brought to the table Parent Patrol because we, I haven't heard of Parent Patrol until she brought it on the table because it's at her school. And so we, we it was funny because we were going through this voting process of all, all the ideas and we were just knocking hers down. Parent Patrol is going to do Parent Patrol. You know, who wants their parents out there and <laughs> at the schools and stuff? And so while we were knocking it down, she took the liberty when we had a press release and she spoke up about her idea and it just they just they absolutely loved it and they wanted to expand it and so she felt past she would not let Parent Patrol go. And Parent Patrol just for everybody is what is that exactly? Uh, she explained to me that Parent Patrol is, um, you have, she said it works at her school that she, her mom's on it. And basically the moms in the morning when the teens, the kids come to school, you know, they greet them, they ask them how they're doing. You know, in case kids are in a bad mood, they, they try to not push them, but try to see what the problem is and basically watch their safe passage to school. And they're usually at the, on the end of the blocks when they come from school and they're usually there to be the eyes mm -hmm. of the school and report something that's dangerous or hazardous and report fights before it happens so they can get dispersed before it escalates to a fight. Mm -hmm. Well, that's so. good to know that there are parents out there in the community mm -hmm. who are involved and, and, and are really directly getting involved in, in the problem. Thank you. Do we have a, a, someone to step up here? Please. And please feel, uh, identify yourself and, um, and state your question. My name is Wanda Hopkins, and I uh, work for Parents United for Responsible Education. And first of all, I'd like to commend uh, the panel uh, for having this discussion. But uh, I, I don't know if I want to make a comment or if I'm, I'm begging for some help. Uh, first of all, we have to understand that uh, what I'm getting, I'm also a trainer for the Chicago Public Schools for Parents uh, that receives no funding. Uh, and, and, and I just want Arnie Duncan to know this in Washington, D.C., there's not a lot of money funding parenting programs. And so what happens to people like us is we become uh, victims because now we're, we're training for no money. And, you know, that becomes a problem after a while mm -hmm. when it's mortgage and rent is due. Mm -hmm. But uh, the first of all, what I'm hearing from parents is that there's no hope. Uh, you got parents who rent is $700 and they receive $641 from, from SSI. So therefore, there's no room for light and gas or any of that that, that comes with just, just basic needs. So what happens if I have a teenage son who see mom struggling, then all they see is the streets. And so what I did is I went to the streets. I went, I went to talk to, I don't know if you all know, but the, the gangs have, you know, legislators like we have. You know, I went to talk to the governors. And, and what I'm hearing is that what, what, what you, the real people don't understand is that they're saying that they have no, the, the reason why they're where they are, they had no support system in place. Mom was on crack. Do, a girlfriend just had a baby. Nobody was willing to help them buy Pampers. They had a felony, so there was no jobs out there. So, and, 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 you know, and I hear all the time, you know, everybody's trying to help, but I'm seeing this. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to my son just the other day where, I mean, right on my street, a kid was getting ready to shoot someone because it was just, it was over some, some drugs and my son walks up to him and I don't want my son killed. But he walked up to him saying, man, it's not worth it. It's just not worth it because he's already in a wheelchair and he's getting ready. And he said, nobody's going to roll you around in jail. They're going to misuse you and misabuse you right. and do all of that. So, you know, what we have to understand is that, first of all, I don't think the city, I'm, I'm not going to go to the nation. 
The city of Chicago does not respect the fact that our children are dying. The city of Chicago does not understand that our children need jobs. Now, when you talk about the city of Chicago, you're talking about City Hall. You're talking uh, you, about the city, city government. Right. And, what, and it sounds like one of your, your big issues is that there needs to be more funding paid attention to some of these parenting programs, the kinds of programs you're involved in. Right, because parents want to do better. And That's, I've always been, to, been I, I believe this, because I've trained hundreds of hundreds of parents. Parents do better if they knew better and if they had the resources to be able to do that. I appreciate that. And, I, I know Pure is a, is a very important organization in town, and I'd, I'd like to see if anyone wants to respond to that. And I know, uh, uh, Mike Flegger, you told me earlier that you had been in some conversations about possibly new, new funding, new support coming from the White House. Is there yeah, and, and any, I, and I any think hope one, I there? Hear what, I hear what you're saying about the, about the city, but I think if we look back over these last particular four years, six years, the first funding that got cut in all this bad economy was, was funding for support, for intervention, for, for crime prevention. And what got, to, what got added on when you wanted anything about crime, what got added on was law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Money came to that, but all the other social service agencies, support agents, counseling, truant, all that got cut. I mean, we saw the fight that the Teal and, and, and group went through for just money back for ceasefire. And so what we've gone to, you know, and you might have seen about three, four months ago, we turned the flag upside down and said we're in a national distress. This is an epidemic because we said we need federal help because as the federal cut those funds, it trickled down. The state cut them and then the city cut them. And that's why we said, you've got to remember, in 24 hours, $1 billion was released for swine flu in this country. That's right. 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Now, if we can release in 24 hours $1 uh, billion for swine flu, because that can affect everybody. That's right. What ought we be doing to deal with children dying in the streets of our cities from Newark to Oakland? So I think we got to get money from the federal because the city and the state, and, and Teal knows as well with their fight, they cut funding because their budgets were cut down from the federal. So the federal government has to give down money that's going to trickle down to state and to cities so that the programs of prevention and support, as you mentioned, and jobs, and the things that help parents if those are not put in place, and the only thing we have is police, this problem is only going to get worse. Go ahead, Teal. And then I totally agree with you in regards to the parents needing support. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we should do anyway is form a, a citywide coalition. So when we go to the table to try to you know, fight for funding, right. we bring people with us so they can be funded as well. You see, I have a pretty good name in the city. I know a lot of politicians. I know a lot of people in different places throughout our overall society across the United States. We should form that coalition, and I don't get funded unless these other groups get funded mm -hmm. as well. See, that's what we have to do, take it on that way and challenge you know, the powers that be in a positive, constructive way, you know, and have all our paperwork together and present it because the parents need so much help. And, and what's different nowadays, I just want to make this point as well. See, like in the 80s, you know, I was a teenager like in the 80s. Uh, you know, there was a lot of opportunity in the 80s, even though I grew up in the projects. I live right by downtown Chicago to hear me on the projects. I get on the L and right downtown. So I would hustle downtown. But the reason I'm making this point, there are no opportunities now like that. The industrial period is over with. There used to be a time where guys can go get a factory job without a resume. Those jobs don't exist anymore. And a lot of parents are living in absolute poverty. Right. So if I can make $50 in my front, at my front door, I'm going to try to make that $50. Because a lot of times, guys on the streets, people say they're making a lot of money, but they're not. The money is not out there in the drug trade like people think it is. In the 80s and the 90s, guys were making millions of dollars, yes. But from the 90s on up to 2000, guys barely make it. They make it they're barely happened? making ends meet. What happened? Two things happened simultaneously. Uh, the Illinois Department of Corrections, just speaking in Chicago, they took over the penitentiaries, period. They locked a lot of the penitentiaries down. Guys are in a cell now for 23 hours a day. Let me repeat that. Guys are locked up in a cell, two to a, to a cell, six by nine cell, for 23 hours a day. They dismantled all the structure within the gangs. I'm not going to say whether that's right or wrong because some people, there are pros and cons to it. They say some of the gang leaders had a lot of power over the guys and they could stop the violence if they wanted to, but I'm not going to get into that. That's a big historical debate. That's the reality. You, you know that, right? Mm -hmm. But what happened also is that just a lot of people end up getting all the uh, RICO Act. The RICO Act was, uh, was enforced. So guys were getting locked up. They were locking up 100 guys at a time. And these guys for, were getting boatloads of time. small infractions, right. Boatloads of time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's the reason why people are breaking the code every day. You lock up 40 guys, 
38 guys are telling on each other before they get to the police station. I mean that. The biggest movie that came out, American Gangster, <laughs> Frank Lucas told on everybody at the end. Right. So don't believe the hype. People breaking the code every day. But these parents need help. I just want to get back to your right. point. Anything I can do to support you, I would be more than willing to support you. Great. Okay, on behalf of Ceasefire, on behalf of what I do as a community activist. Well, thank, as thank a, you. I, I'm just going to say this for the record. Um, yeah. Just quickly, because we've got other folks um, waiting. Uh, yeah. There's also, there's no facilities for young folks to be. Uh, you f from Henry Horner, I used to walk right here because I'm from Cabrini Green, September 1st, 1960. Right. And I've been fighting all my life, and I've been watching and overlooking Chicago Public Schools for 33 years. So you may not want to attach your name with me because <laughs> when, you, when you're watching the Chicago Public Schools and see what I see, then your funding is snatched oh. because they don't want you to tell the whole truth. So just be careful about Wanda Hopkins and her name. Because well, I'm not scared because as long as our children are dying, yeah. right. I can do it for free. That's right. Because I still know a man, and I'm not going to get into that, <laughs> who will look over me in spite of it all. But I just want to Ms. Hopkins, we have to, I want to I move on because okay. we've got some other folks w waiting. But thank you. Thanks very much for what yeah, you do. We'll okay? Oh, okay? Next, the next person up, please. Thank you. I'm Ann Breen Greco. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Hopkins, for stepping up here. She said many of the things I was thinking, as did Father Flager in response. I'm in the legal profession, and I was agreeing with you, Father Flager, when you were talking about uh, the need to bring conflict resolution skills to youth. Uh, I'm an alternative dispute practitioner, and uh, we, I, I am trying to organize within our community because uh, we need everybody. We need uh, professional people. We need legal people. We need everybody involved in this issue. It is more than just one community, more than just one city. And so, it, but it does bear emphasizing uh, some of the things Ms. Hopkins was saying about hope. We, we can give you some things. Uh, we can give them some skills, but my real concern is that we can't give youth right now a whole lot of hope, a whole lot of vision, uh, looking forward to a college education, and looking forward to a career. These are the things that concern me. We don't, at this time, have the national policy that says our youth are important. It's not just Chicago. We're not fighting a little lonely battle here. This really is a national problem. And so, so, so you, you, would you like them to respond to that? Pardon me? Would you like them to respond to that? Oh, yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, the only thing I'd say to that is, I mean, I, I agree with you. To me, there's nothing sadder and there's nothing more frightening in my life than to look in the eyes of a high school student who's lost hope, who's given up. Um, and, but that's why I also think that amidst all the street work we do, that one of the folks that have failed in this whole thing is the faith communities. That the churches, the synagogues and mosques, we have failed. We have failed to create people of hope and people of action. We've turned into ourselves and built our own little kingdoms and we don't see the streets as what makes us credible anymore. And so we fail to give people the hope because if we say that we know a God who can do all things, then we can't walk out in the street and be hopeless. And I think we have failed to be the instruments of hope and failed to teach hope to our people who have been the instruments of hope then in their communities, their blocks, and their neighborhoods. So I, I think that's a real issue, but I think it can, it, it, we, it's a failure of us, the reason we have that issue. What's, what's the, yeah, that's pretty uh, damning. You're talking about your, your colleagues and, and your church leaders. If, if right. they can't offer hope, who can? What's, what's behind that? Well, I think we've got built up in ourselves. You know, churches and synagogues, and my, I mean, the faith communities have turned into a you know, Fortune 500 business. You know, it's their, their competing to see who can build the bigger buildings, who has a plane, who has the nicest cars, who can live in the nicest houses. It's a game. You know, they're, they're the new crooks. And so, you know, I mean, it's just the reality. I mean, so they're doing their own thing. You want to name some and, names, Mike? Uh, no, no, ma'am. Um, no, ma'am. But, but I, think, and I, and I think everybody up here in the, in the panel would agree with me. This, a, lot of the, a lot of these young brothers on the streets look at, at, the, at the churches as gangsters. You know, they're just gangsters in suits and alligator shoes. That's all. And so we have to understand that we've, we've lost our credibility 
And you can't be, have any credibility on the street until you have credibility within your own house. Mm -hmm. So I think the church synagogue and mosque got to understand we, we've lost our value system. We've lost our perspective. We've lost our credibility. Get your house in order. And remember, we're in the mega churches now. Mm -hmm. You know, Ebenezer Baptist Church wasn't a mega church. It held about 300 people. Dexter Avenue Church in Montgomery wasn't a mega church. It's not about mega church. It's about mega impact. What are you doing in the neighborhood? And if the neighborhood is falling apart and going to hell and you have a big church on the corner, you're a failure. That's right. Appreciate that. We go to the next person. Uh, hi, my name is, excuse me, hi, my name is Terrence Sims. And two of, the, um, two of the things that I had to say had already been touched on as far as the investment in the youth and the way that nationally there's no money being put, not enough money being put into things for youth to have to do besides hang out on the street or go within themselves. But since that was already covered, the thing I really want to touch on right now is that us as a society, we don't want to do the work that is necessary to get this done. We all recognize that there's a problem. We can all see it on the news, we all see it on TV, read about it in the paper. But that's something for a lot of us, that's as far as it goes. We don't want to get up. And I know we all have our bills, we all have our jobs, we all have everything that's going on in our lives, but if we as individuals don't step up and do something, just my little bit of the part of the puzzle, your little bit, add it to your little bit, add it to your little bit, eventually it'll compound and grow, and grow into something else. We don't want to work to save our children. We want to sit back and look at our children and say, well, it's a shame that this is going on. I can't believe that this is going on in my neighborhood, or I can't believe that these people are living like this. Mm -hmm. but, what are we doing as individuals to help change the situation? That's a great question. Anyone want to take that on? You We're know, not doing enough. What can we do as individuals? Well, just let me highlight one example that speaks to the heart of what this gentleman just said. We had the incident with Darian, horrible incident, right? And immediately following that, we had uh, clergy, and not just clergy, but we had community-based organizations, a number of people who stood and said that they were going to sign up to have a minimum of 75 or 80 adults identified and trained to do safe passage in around just one school, around Finger. People signed their name on the list, gave contact numbers, information, et cetera. Uh, we followed through to arrange that training, working with that school. We had 20 volunteers show up. Hmm. And how many folks st stood up and said they were going to bring people on board? It should have been with the 50 or 75 on the list, hmm. the commitment was to have at least three people representing each organization or church. So we can do the math. And we had 20 people. And what's so unfortunate about that is the reality is that I told everyone involved that we were going to have maybe 20 or 25 people show up. Because, and that's just one simple example, but that speaks to the hard work that is necessary to do this stuff. I, you know, I don't know about these guys, but I'm tired. Mm -hmm. And I've only been back doing this work since, in, in this capacity since July. But I've been in Chicago doing this kind of work all my lifetime. And it's going to require us to be tired. Right? Because if we have, if we're serious about our kids, uh, the same thing I ask folks to do for youth, I'm a baseball coach, basketball coach, I mentor. See? That's also so in addition to the work you do On the person, yeah, outside of the mm -hmm. suit. That's outside what's going to be required for us to turn this thing around. No, I just want to, I know you have a few more people that, okay. that want to ask questions, but uh, back to the young man's question. I would suggest that everybody just uh, try to work with five youth each, some of the most highest risk youth out there, and just do the best you can because it takes a village to raise one child, and uh, it takes an enormous amount of manpower to work with one child as well because these young people have a lot of issues they bring to the table, but if you can work with five each and just try to help guide them, you know, in a lot of different directions with, on, on a positive level. For example, if you're a business owner, you know, you don't have to hire the guys. Try to, like, mentor four or five guys from the deep neighborhood. 
Just go out if you want to get in contact with me. I have a whole list of hundreds of young men and women that I can introduce you to, uh, and then you can work with them. You can't take on the whole world. If you can work with two or three of them, turn them around, you're doing a wonderful job. Trust me what I tell you, because we're all tired. And you don't have to be older to be tired. You can be young and be tired, because I get calls all the time. All the time. Just want to have that. Lori, are you, are you, is your organization looking for, for volunteers and young people to get more involved? How do you go about finding young people, and is there some, something this audience can do to help you bring in more recruits? How we go about bringing young people is, um, well, how I found out about MIGFA was through, a, it was a string, it was through a mentoring. I was all, my mentor had told me about MIGFA. And at first I was like, little, I don't think so, but then pushed me on to get into MIGFA. And, and when I did, it just, I was just surprised at how teen, how could I be so interested in politics? Mm -hmm. I thought that politics was just, just I just thought politics was dirty. Honestly, I just mm -hmm. think people what a surprise. just. What Why would you think that? <laughs> <laughs> so the mikvah. You're talking about the mikvah challenge. Yeah, tell, mikvah tell challenge. Tell the audience a little bit about what that is and, and what you do. At um, mikvah challenge get youth, teens involved in politics and policy making, and in mikvah you meet with a lot of officials. My, my, um, myself, I've met with T.O. Harding, um, and we discussed ceasefire and some of our strategies. And I met with a few um, other officials, and we've discussed like a, a lot of problems concerning youth. And we've also asked them what they could do or what they, or suggestions. And they come to us for the uh, suggestions on what we can do to prevent it or what youth can do to prevent it. And for anyone looking for a volunteer, looking to get someone volunteer to MIGFA, um, you could, well, I'll get the number or whatever, but you could get teens, let them know about MIGFA, and they can call, call us and we can get them involved because MIGFA has a lot of teens and they're separated into three groups. And these three groups focus on different, like my group, we focus on safety. Another group focuses on education, and there's another group that focuses on health. And we can use as much youth as we can in this because we are speaking for youth and teens, and so we can use all the youth input and suggestions and their experiences to get our goal accomplished. It's probably, you probably have a website, right? That they yes, we do. On, you know what the, the address is? I'm going to say mikvajust.com. Right. Uh, we can get it later on. All right, or you go I'm sure you can get it if you Google. Yeah. Get everything on Google now. We have another comment, question? Thank you guys for being here. I do appreciate your, uh, your views. Ms. Washington, I really appreciate you interjecting um, the female view. I'm Danielle Willis from Women United for Hope and Peace. And one of our concerns was Renaissance 2010. I found it very ironic that Arne Duncan was one of the individuals designated by the Obama administration to come back to Chicago. I know earlier it was mentioned that um, by Mr. Brown that our kids feel like they're responsible, but there have always been fail safes in our communities. And these fail safes are the institutions that we don't hold responsible now. And I was wondering if you have any views on Renaissance 2010, how we're taking our kids out of their community and we're not providing them with the conflict resolution. Would it have been a better solution to perfect the community schools, give them the tools that they need to create these relationships and these interpersonal skills that they need to conduct themselves as um, productive citizens? Okay. Mm -hmm. And please, yeah, go ahead and explain what uh, sure. Renaissance 2010 well, is. Renaissance 2010 was an initiative to create charter schools. And I was working for Chicago Public Schools at the time, so I'm acutely aware of when it was rolled out. Uh, and I worked for the administration. Um, there's no way that anyone can say that Chicago Public Schools clearly understands that some of the issues should have been better thought out. Um, I will not indict the movement to create new schools and new opportunities in and of itself. 
but some of these issues which were raised at the time, um, it's obvious now, even in what you see with the response to Finger, that uh, institutions can play a role or can, can sometimes, even if it's unknowingly, contribute to factors. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you have to uh, be willing to work with people, even if we disagree. Um, if we draw a line in the sand and we refuse to communicate and work with one another, uh, I don't think anybody can win mm -hmm. uh, as a result. So I think that obviously uh, no one who was involved, I'm sure Arnie Duncan did not wish to see any young person lose his life. And just explain uh, what, what, is the, what is the charge or the allegation as it relates to the finger incidents? Well, in, in, what uh, happened is, and it, this is a situation with a number of schools, when schools were closed, boundaries were changed. And those boundaries, of course, are not, um, they don't sometimes uh, meet the same boundary or the same course of what happens in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So kids from very different neighborhoods end up coming to schools outside of where they grew up. Mm -hmm. And many of these schools, even before the changes were made, if we're honest, had challenges. Mm -hmm. So if they already have challenges and then you have young people coming from different neighborhoods, that's, that's an issue. Uh, and it has to... to uh, I'm sure it created some problems. Uh, and you have to do a lot of hard work to try to address it. So uh, specifically to the issue with Finger, you had young folks who at one time went to Carver High School before it was changed into Carver Military, who then went to Finger High School, mm -hmm. okay? Um, coming outside of the neighborhood uh, and Finger, even before the change was made, had challenges, mm -hmm. right? Uh, matter of fact, you know, you talk to many of the parents, um, they've been very honest, and they were saying that it was fights at Finger in a number of schools 10 to 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So this thing has been as with a number, right? right? I went to Simeon High School, and I, you know, I'm not ashamed to say I came out in 82, <laughs> but it was fights yeah. then, right? Um, so, I don't know if, if you can say it's one contributing factor, but we have to work together. We have, institutions have to work with community to really look at and hear and really listen and to see if they're doing the right thing or doing everything possible right. not to create these situations. Mm -hmm. Plus, I just want to add to that okay. real quick. When Arnie Duncan was the CEO here of Chicago Public Schools, I met with him on numerous occasions, and I informed Arnie Duncan that the community has been broken down. We're living in dysfunctional community settings right now, and a lot of money that went into any particular program, I don't care if it was Renaissance 2010 or Renaissance 2050, the bottom line, if you don't put the resources out in the community where the violence spills over into the community, in front of the community, back into the school, you can't address the issue completely because a lot of money has been spent. I'm talking about to the tune of 30 million, 50 million here or there over the years, and it could have been best spent working with that high-risk population. A lot of young men end up dropping out of school or being put out of school who still need services, and they end up just like right on the side of the school keeping up a lot of mess as well. So we have to address the issues outside the school and really get them guys and, and ladies the help they need. That was my advice to Arnie Duncan when it came down to Renaissance mm -hmm. 2010, my thing is all about building a healthy community. Because right. the kids mm -hmm. are, are afraid to go to school in some cases. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids drop out because they're traumatized by going to school. Some of these kids don't even get a chance to eat breakfast, breakfast before they leave home. So now all of a sudden, they're on their way to school, they're being harassed. Mm -hmm. It's not right. Mm -hmm. And we as a people have to try to fix that. And it comes back down to what the young lady was saying about the parenting. Right. People need help. When you're living in absolute poverty, the choices you have are very limited. And some of the choices you make are not going to be the best choices, and that's all I have to say. Okay. Next. Yeah. 
Um, I just, um, my name is Nora. I just wanted to comment on the um, question you asked on what are we doing for the young women. Um, I'm a peer of Floyd. I'm on the Youth Safety Council also. Um, and I just wanted to say that violence is not a gender issue. Regardless if you're a woman or a man, you're still going to be affected by violence. And we also did recommendations. And one that really can relate to the gender, the woman's gender issue is we made a recommendation to focus on med media li literacy, how um, men don't portray women as strong persons, rather they um, abuse them. So we wanted to, um, we made recommendations um, to the commissioners to um, have media literacy to middle school so they can know how the media is affecting them um, and how it's affecting their actions to become more violent rather than to um, be more positive, be more a positive think uh, thinker. Also, I wanted to say that women are um, active in um, our council. We have um, half women and half men, and it's a place where um, we're not judging each other based on our gender. We all listen to each other, and the women in our council, um, I can speak by um, on my experience. Um, we're not just involved in MIFCA challenge, we're also involved in our peer jury in the school and our peer jury. Um, we try to focus on the troubled um, students who are gonna get suspended, and rather than getting suspended, we listen to, their, to, um, to what happened to them, and we try to look to an alternative for them, um, rather than go with um, suspension. That way we could avoid suspension, and they could be on a more positive path. Thank you. Before you leave, tell, tell us, how did you get involved in, in, in the youth council and some of the other work you're doing? Oh, um, in my school, they offer programs where they help you with your homework. And, any, um, and it was in spring when they were accepting applications. And um, the program was handing out applications. And it said, um, are you interested in, um, in doing something positive for your community? And they had different choices that said, um, the youth um, violence, um, the youth safety council, the education council, and the health council, and um, they sent me an application where it's um, I did I filled out the application and I did an interview, and they called me like two weeks later, mm -hmm. so I got accepted through it and it's been a positive experience because we have learned how to um, analyze, um, research and um, come up with innovative um, recommendations. Thank you. What high school do you go to? Um, Benito Juarez. Oh, thank you very much. Great work. Great idea. Great. The media literacy piece, I think, is so important. Mike, you, you've, uh, you've crusaded on this whole issue of images, violent images in the media, especially against women and girls. Yeah, I mean, we, we just fought hard to say that what we see affects us. And, you know, whether what we listen to, you know, our eyes and our ears, that's the floodgates. And, you know, what's coming into us. And everything that comes into us comes out. So the images, what we see, the images that we hear in music, if, if you consistently listen to music that identifies a woman as a bee, sooner or later, when you get mad at some girl, she's going to be that bee. Mm -hmm. And so you have to stop feeding yourself that stuff and think, well, I'm just listening to the music or it's not affecting me. Words are seeds, and they grow, and, they, and sooner or later they bear, they bear fruit. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I just make one comment on the, the other person that in turn about education is that, you know, I think, I think a point that Teal made is so important that we, we, we look at schools as oasis from the communities, and we can't. Mm -hmm. The community and the school have to be connected and integrated. But the other thing is, and I, and I just don't understand this, we know how to do education. We know how to do a Whitney Young. We know how to do a, 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 um, a Walter Payton. We know how to do education. We just choose not to do it everywhere. We have not made a decision that we want to educate everybody in excellent education. So it's unequal resources, unequal structure, unequal infrastructure, unequal master teachers, unequal. We have all this. And, and, and I blame the education systems and the unions as equally as the parents and everybody else. We're all responsible. But we know how to do education. So I'm just a believer in education, whether it's 2010, whether it's homeschooling, whether it's private education, whether it's charter school, whether it's public school. I don't care what it is, but it better be good. That's right. <laughs> well, let's break it down. Why are we not doing education? We're doing education in the Whitney Youngs and the, and the Walter Paytons, but we're not doing it in other places. What's the difference? Well, I think it's a will. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's well. I mean, we, we and I think that goes all the way down. You know, we look at where Illinois is, is in funding across this country. We're one of the worst in funding across this country. And I think it's a will all the way down in terms of educating all people equal in this country. And so you can not just look in Chicago. You can look at every urban city across this country and see the same thing. But it's about, it's about class and race. It's about it? class and race. Yeah. 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 Okay. Do you have a question? Sure. Um, what do you think can be done to break the code of silence? Because I know you touched on it before that some people are coming forward and talking, but a lot of people feel like they're snitches when they go forward or they want to take it into their own hands. And I know where I'm from, police have to beg people to come forward even when there's been a shooting and um, some kid got shot in broad daylight, 40 people saw it, no one will speak about it. Mm -hmm. So what do you think can be done to break that code of silence? Excellent question. Well, let, let me say this first. Uh, I don't, and people get a little, uh, my partners at the police department sometimes get a little uh, nervous when I say this. I don't advocate just that people only go to police. If, if you're not comfortable going to police with the information, find somebody else. Find other leaders in the community that you can go to. But this is what uh, I do know that we cannot continue to happen. We will all suffer. Many of us will suffer innocently if we continue to have, and we'll just discuss juveniles, if we continue to have 500 juvenile gun incidents a year and only 40% of the, of the shooters are arrested, we all gonna suffer. Those are, those are real life Those statistics. are real numbers. That's, two, that's, la that's 2008 st mm -hmm. statistics. About 40% of the shooters were arrested. About 500 shootings for 17 and under. So what does that mean? That means when I'm coming in the neighborhood or my mother is coming out of Walgreens or Jewels and this shooter, which everybody on the block knows who it is, they have not spoken to T.O. They haven't talked to Father Flager, given the information to some officer, even in their family. It's going to lead to another shooter. And eventually, eventually, I will be the victim of that. So what are we trying to do? Because we just don't want to talk about the problem. We're trying to come up with solutions. One of the things that you'll see come out very soon is I'm working with a group of mothers that are real victims of these horrific incidents, some of which you've seen in, in the media. Blair Holt's mom, uh, a number of other mothers, uh, African-American and Hispanic in particular. And we just paid to develop some wonderful uh, public service announcements, some PSAs, because I wanted their voices. Um, the superintendent of police, the mayor, don't nobody know me. But if you hear it from a real mother whose son was innocently killed and no one has come and given the information to anyone, the injustice of that, if you hear the voice and you hear the pain from mothers, we all love our mothers. So we're, we're starting with those messages. We're going to use those in the schools. We're going to use those to start discussions. We believe that if we make real human beings out of the people that are left behind because of these incidents, that's one approach. That's one thing that can help us get to where we won't have these incidents. The most, and I'll be quiet, but I, this is an incident that many of the audience probably heard about, but one in particular that really stuck with me. The, the young man, Justin Daniels, that was killed in August before he was going to college. He was a uh, single child, right? He was preparing to go to college. He was working at the Museum of Science and Industry for the summer, Befriend, befriended a young lady that he liked. Uh, she had a party, and he went to the party. There was two young men there who wanted his car. Justin told the young lady, I'm sorry, 
The young men told the young lady, we want to take his car. And she said, well, no, don't, don't, don't do that. Leave him alone. But she didn't mention it to anyone else. Later on that evening, those young men asked Justin for a ride home. And you know the rest. So Deborah, she didn't have to call the police yeah. to prevent that. Am I right? She, she could have whispered in his ear, yeah. could have an adult that was there. There were a number of ways that that senseless incident could have been provided. That's what we need to begin yeah. right. to work with. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have time for one more question? Hi, my name is Katie Dara. I'm an urban studies student in Chicago just for the semester, and I'm currently interning with BUILD, um, which is a local organization that um, does gang prevention intervention as well as post-secondary planning. And um, Father Flager, you mentioned that you believe we need um, more and stronger partnerships between institutions as well as those in leadership roles um, to confront this problem. Um, and being at BUILD and studying youth violence um, through my program, I'm struck by the varying ways in which organizations structure themselves to confront this program. Um, for example, ceasefire, um, working to stop violence immediately before it occurs as opposed to other organizations that might take a more preventative approach. Um, and so considering that and that this, um, that approaches to the problem can feel somewhat fragmented or incomplete, how do you think we can um, create connections between organizations to create a more comprehensive response. I, I just said that, that Teal mentioned earlier about coalitions coming together and we should go for that funding together and make sure that, that everybody is meeting some part of the puzzle of that need. Mm -hmm. You know, as Teal mentioned earlier, I, I have no problem calling him when I have a gang intervention thing that I need of somebody in any part of the city, including my own neighborhood. And he knows he can call me if it's something that's going on in our neighborhood, somebody needs to be mentored or a child who's, I've gotten calls of, hey, a kid lives 10 blocks from your church or 15 blocks from your church, could you get involved in some program? He needs a positive alternative. So I, I think that we have to understand the egos have to be put aside. Um, and, and those that are, for lack of a better word, exploiting or pimping this whole issue had to be put aside. Our children are dying. And if that doesn't make us come together, what is going to make us come together? And so I think we have to begin to understand we're all, if we're all in this for the same issue as to save children's lives, then we have to understand that we have to work and talk and connect with each other, help each other, support each other. When they were cutting funding for ceasefire, I was writing letters to the governor saying, you need to reinstate money for ceasefire. We all have to understand that we're in, we, we can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. You know, we keep saying it takes a whole village, but we won't be a village. <laughs> and so we, we have... I think times ought to be causing us at this point to say, you know, help. Yeah. And we need, to, we need to join hands and work together. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Tio? No, I just want to like to say before we conclude, I just want to, you know, I really like the work of the Mick for Challenge organization. Mm -hmm. I think they're doing a tremendous job with the youth on a regular basis. And uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Brother Howard Lathan there from uh, CAPS organization. They've been doing a lot of work for years. So it's all about collaborating. That's the point I'm trying to make. And Because uh, a lot of times people get caught up because they think ceasefire wants the media all the time. But I'm here to tell you, on behalf of ceasefire, I'm willing to share the spotlight with anybody. If, it's, if it comes down to saving a child. And you would never see me do an interview on CNN, History Channel, BET, and all the local news stations if I'm not really out there working with the youth. Mm -hmm. That's the difference with T.O. Hardiman. If I'm not out there really preventing violence amongst the youth population, I would decline all interviews. The only reason you see me out there talking the issue up is because I'm right there on ground zero. Mm -hmm. And I'm at the White House level as well. And young men need to understand that we can always, you know, polish up our skills. I met with the Queen of Jordan last week in Washington, D.C. at the Canadian Embassy. I didn't know she was a queen. I talked to her like she was just an another young lady there. And somebody whispered to me, that's the Queen of Jordan. I say, well, she's my queen today. <laughs> so I'm just saying, we know we got to mix it up a little bit. Exposure is everything. And I'm the same brother that grew up in the projects. I've traveled to 40 different states in the, in the United States. I'm trying to knock out all 50. I'm not in no rush, but, you know, exposure is everything. I've been a, across, the, you know, across the Atlantic Ocean. I've been to Europe a few times. I've been to most of the islands. So I'm grateful. Because when I turned my life around many, many years ago, you know, the sky is the limit now. Young people need to understand that. Right. Yeah. 
Right. That's it. Yeah, well, I, I liked your, the idea you had earlier about bringing together this coalition that goes to the White House and goes to City Hall and asks yeah, for support right. together. Mm -hmm. So I, together. I, I hope all of you are going to take some, uh, make a commitment tonight mm -hmm. to take some leadership on bringing that coalition together. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mr. Hampton and, and Floyd, would you like to have the mm -hmm. final words? Mm -hmm. Floyd's, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> well, um, Final words. Okay, um, this <laughs> this panel, this discussion. This is um, my first dis panel discussion, and I would never have known. <laughs> You're really articulate, and polished. Thank you. Um, I am just so interested in all of what you guys had to say, and even when we were backstage, I was just into it and <laughs> it is just so interesting. It makes me want to get more involved and um, just be more of a better person. And this this is the first, and I was thinking about having, doing another one because it's just it's mm -hmm. interesting and I like the topic and the opinions that you guys had to say and, the, and what the opinions that the public had to say. So. Thank you for all you do. You're, this is a buddy politician we've got up here, one of the good politicians, not the dirty ones. <laughs> I want to thank Floyd Brown, Philip Hampton, Tio Hardiman, and Father Michael Flager for being here tonight. And thanks for all of you for listening and for your comments as well.